All right, welcome everybody to uh, our virtual launch for the 28th of September. Uh, we've got a very special guest with us today, but before we get to him, we're gonna get an update from Bill Hill, our president, class of 84. Well, howdy, Ags, and thank you, uh, thank you, Logan, for that introduction. Wow, again, what a year it's been, and I'm, uh, again, here to report the a &M Club of San Antonio is as strong as ever. Uh, membership is uh, maintaining about the same despite the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, we've just recently celebrated some very successful events. And I just want to highlight uh, real briefly. I mentioned it before, but the Aggie Family Barbecue became the Aggie Park Barbecue. And we basically uh, made plates and delivered them in, a, uh, in an assembly line uh, two cars as they drove by uh, to get them. In addition to that, we made plates for 400 first responders and, and emergency uh, medical personnel that those were donated. All in all, we made 897 plates of chicken and beans and potato salad. Many thanks to those volunteers. I just wanna highlight that's the biggest uh, barbecue we've ever had. Uh, keeping in line with that, we know the next thing we just recently ended up uh, earlier this month was the, uh, the golf tournament. Again, um, 140 golfers, the biggest golf tournament we had, great success. It was just great getting together with Ags. Uh, it was such a great time. So thanks to all those volunteers that helped uh, set that up. Here, uh, just last week, we had the um, coaches night. And if you didn't get a chance to see the coaches night, it'll be recorded. You can go to the Aggie Park uh, website, go to events. Uh, past events and you can uh, catch the coaches night. Anyway, it was a challenge. I can tell you that we only had about three or four days notice that we were actually going to pull this thing off. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, it was just a Thursday and we didn't get, we didn't find out about it until Monday. So another great event, good hearing the coach. Uh, anyway, we'll, uh, we'll work on coaches night in person next year. Look, the next big event we have is the uh, skeet shoot. October 30th, that's at the San Antonio Gun Club right near downtown. I'd like to be able to report in November that we had the biggest uh, participation of, this, of, this, of the skeet shoot in history as well. It's becoming a theme with some of our events in this COVID-19. There's not a lot of activities to get out and go do. So these things that are outside, uh, they're safe and we do a good job of social distancing and taking care of business. Hopefully I'll see you there on, uh, on the skeet shoot. Hey, real quick, I want to give another quick update on our capital campaign. Our capital campaign is that fundraising campaign we have to raise the money, $1.6 million needed for the expansion and renovation of Aggie Park. We're at $1.1 million, and now a large part of that is thanks to the Mays Family Foundation. Uh, they have pledged $450,000, and all we had to do was match that $450,000, and that will bring us to our goal of $1.6 million. So 1.1, we're at now. Really, what we need is, is $250,000 more from Aggies uh, in the A&M Club. That will be matched, and that will equal the $500,000 we need to go. And we're looking forward to starting that renovation expansion project. We don't have a firm date, but we're thinking after Aggie muster in 2021. You know, one of the things I wanted to point out was, you know, there are a few big donors that have donated uh, to the capital campaign. A lot of the longstanding members, the lifetime members of the Aggie Club. But we're up to 299 individual donors and pledge givers. And so that's, that represents about one third of the membership of the San Antonio A&M Club. So for all you that have donated, thank you very, very much. We've gone a long way. We still have a ways to go. I keep saying this, and I, I really mean this sincerely. Um, we really only have 25 more donors to donate $10,000, and that will be the $250,000 that we need, or 250 donors to donate a thousand. Anything you can do out there to uh, to help participate and contribute to the uh, project will be greatly appreciated. This project, and, and most of you have seen what we're going to do, is going to be second to none. We already are the only A&M club that has its own property and its own building. And this is something that is going to be uh, at the exceptional level. So 
Again, more to follow. Uh, we're going to have some uh, videos and we're going to really move towards trying to uh, fundraise by the end of the year and reach that goal. Anyway, uh, thanks, Ags, for all you're doing. Hope you're staying safe. Uh, football season uh, it has started and uh, see you at a game maybe or see you around. And in, in a closing note, we're looking to start meeting again on Monday uh, lunch in October. And the exact date, we'll get back to you, but uh, hopefully it'll be sooner than later as we're all learning to deal with and live with COVID-19. Hey, Logan, that's my update. I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Bill, for your update. Uh, we're, uh, we're, we're doing the best we can with what we've got in 2020. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce our guest that we have today he received the Distinguished Alumni Award from Texas A&M in 2018. He is a San Antonio entrepreneur, the closest thing we have to the Shark Tank in San Antonio, Graham Weston, class of 86. How are you doing? Thank you. Good. Just great, Logan. I, I like the Shark Tank reference. That's a, that's a first. Thank you. And indeed, I, I am class of 86. I, I want to put it after my name on my little thing here. So proud to be here. Thank you. Well, thanks for uh, joining us, and uh, well, let's uh, let's get right into it. Um, you know, uh, a lot a lot of people know about Rackspace and, and your involvement with that, but uh, not a lot of people know how you got there and, and your upbringing and, and what got you to A and M and the Agriculture Economics Department, which uh, I share a degree from uh, an Ag Ec degree as well. So uh, very good. I'm proud to talk to another Ag Ec major. So uh, yeah, tell us about uh, you know where you were born and how you how you got to AM. Well, when in seventh grade, um, I asked my parents to move move. I said I really wanted to show steers in the stock show and be part of 4-H and FFA, and so I uh, persuaded my parents to to move out to our ranch uh, full time. And I always was an ag kid. I grew up with manure on my boots and. Uh, and, and really loved it. My, my father had been a businessman here in San Antonio. Um, he had been a, had a cookie bakery here in San Antonio that had gone from probably 100 employees to three. And so my father was way more, uh, his heart was more in the ranch than it was uh, in his business. So I was, it was good for me because I, I literally uh, thought that, I mean, when I went to n &M, I thought I was going to come back and run the ranch. And, um, you know, we have, uh, we're, the ranch is right near New Braunfels, um, about uh, four to 500 head of, of mother cows, just to give you a sense of scope. So it's not small, not big, but you know, it, and it had, but always lots to do. And, um, but, and I loved it out there. And I really I went through FFA and, and uh, was uh, just loved it being, uh, being in a rural school. I went to Marion High School, which is right near McQueenie. And uh, so my father to this day is disappointed that I didn't come back and run the ranch. Uh, I'm, I'm serious. He's 96, but he still wishes I'd come back to run the ranch. Um, I, I told him once that it wasn't it better that I helped him pay off the ranch, but uh, he doesn't agree with me. But, uh, you know, that, that was my path. I really, I went to AM expecting to, uh, to, to run the ranch, but I started a business about halfway through that kind of took me in the direction of real estate. And um, so, you know, that's, that's sort of how I ended up at AM. I never applied anywhere else. Uh, I really can't imagine uh, having gone to gone to any university that would have been better for for me, and um, I certainly think it's I'm thankful. So thankful for all the great ags and the support that I've had over the years. Well, you talked about um, starting a business while you're at A and M. What what uh, what business did you get into while at school? So it was a property tax consulting business. So um, my my father's ranch sprawled across two counties and four school districts and we had had uh, very complex property tax you know we had we had over 150 property tax bills and so one summer i was put in charge of of sort of making sure that all the taxes were straight and uh and so one year i i really dug into that for my father and found i, I said you know i bet i could help other people in the same way so i went back to uh back to Aggie land, uh, really kind of switched all of my classes over to real estate and finance. Um, and fortunately, the ag department stuck with me. Uh, so, and I, uh, I ended up getting uh, uh, some clients, uh, my first two clients, a lot of you may rec uh, recognize um, if you're uh, an old ag. Uh, the first client was San Antonio Savings. 
And the second client was Government Employees Credit Union, now called uh, San Antonio Credit Union. And they, they, had, uh, they had foreclosed on properties that, uh, that and, and why I then went and helped them protest the tax assessments on them. And by the time I got out of school, um, a year and a half later, I had two very substantial wins of very difficult cases under my belt. And I actually went into business with my college roommate. And so that's the business I started. That business still is around. It's called Assessment Technologies. Um, it, it has about uh, 50 employees here between here and Houston and uh, very proud of it. That was where I got my start. It also got me a, a lot of experience in the real estate business. And ultimately, um, I put together a group of investors to go buy distressed real estate in uh, the early 90s. And uh, the, the trophy asset of, of, of what we bought was the, is what is now modestly called Weston Center, 112 East Pecan. And so, that's, so it was the tax business that got me into the, into the real estate business. And, and then uh, if you want to talk about how did the uh, real estate business get you into the technology business? Well, let me tell you a funnier story first, Logan. Right. Um, I, uh, I graduated in six and a half years. And uh, I don't know if that resonates with anybody in the audience. But, uh, you know, I, I squeezed four years into six and a half. And uh, the, one of the reasons was because I, uh, I took a semester off to start a business. <clears throat> Um, this was before the tax business came along. Uh, it was the uh, it was 1985, um, and I opened up a a uh, a cookies and ice cream shop on Northgate that right now houses the Dry Bean Saloon. Wow! Right next to the Dixie Chicken, um, and uh, it was it was that year was the year that that uh, alcohol went to 20. You had to be 21 to drink. And so I really thought there was an opportunity to create a different activity on Northgate. So I, if you've ever seen the sort of the cookies with co those ice cream sandwich things, we have a hot cookie with a ice cream in the middle. That was my big idea. And I was going to go cre uh, start one of these on Northgate, which I did in, uh, in the driving saloon. The problem is, you know, the lesson I want everybody to listen very carefully to this. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, here, there I was, age 21. Guess who owned the building, the driving saloon? Who's it, that? It was the owner of the Dixie Chicken. Okay. And so he wouldn't let me just rent the building. The building had never been occupied. He'd never used it. It was just used for storage. And so the owner of the Dixie Chicken, uh, some of you may remember, his name is Don Ganter. He's, he's, uh, he passed away recently, uh, a few years ago. Don insisted that I go into business with him. And he, put up, he ended up putting up all the money and I became his partner. So, um, and uh, we were all ready to, to have a great business together until he pulled a gun on me uh, up in his office upstairs above where the hamburger, hamburgers are made. And uh, he, uh, he expressed his dissatisfaction with our partnership agreement. He felt that I, that I had uh, too good a deal. And he said, you know, either I yield to his demands or else, uh, you know, bad things would happen. And he literally slapped his, his revolver on the table and on the desk in front of him and I was scared to death and I remember going doing going walking down the stairs of the Dixie Chicken down from his office down to the outside and just being shaking so violently I never went I never went back I uh, I never uh, I just basically left and never went back and uh, so um, you know so uh, that was the end of my venture with Don Gander we actually never opened so there you have it Wow, that's uh, that's yeah. pretty wild. I thought that was figuratively when you said he pulled a gun on you. That uh, no, that's pretty wild. Well, I will admit he didn't point it at me like this. He basically put it on the table. Uh, you know, he he, he liked to sort of be load, loaded up, spin the spin the tump, spin the uh, whatever that's called. I'm trying to think of what it. And then he put it down on the table in front of me and said, you know, I really want to redo our partnership, and I don't like the deal, and you know, I just uh, can't live with it, and so. Uh, I certainly felt that. And uh, anyway, it's uh, no hard feelings anymore. He, he was a character and it was a real lesson. It, you know, it really is a lesson that it matters who we're in business with, whether they're our the equity partners or just our collaborators, it sure matters. And uh, that was a good lesson for me. But that's one of the reasons why I graduated so late. So Logan, I'll get back to your question. I just couldn't resist that one. Well, thanks for sharing um, that story. That's great. <laughs>
So your question is, how did I get into the tech business? You know, I, I, um, I was not a techie, a techie person um, before Rackspace. Um, you know, I used to think that a hard drive was taking my kids to West Texas, right? That's a, that's normally where people laugh, but yeah. uh, you know, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I'm, laugh. I'm laughing. I'm laughing. So. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Audience, I don't hear you laughing. So no. So what happened was um, my business partner uh, was a man named Morris Miller. He and I were were looking for a business opportunity. I was running my real estate business and my tax business. Uh, this was in um, in 1998, and um, well, we were at, we were actively looking for business opportunities, and we stumbled across uh, three recent Trinity graduates who had this idea that they would rent web servers. They would rent servers to people who wanted to run websites, and back in those days, it was very hard to get very, very high speed internet access. And, and so um, normally it would take you probably two months to get internet run to your office. And even in the, the internet you got was no good. So the idea was that we would sort of turn, we would be able to rent servers to people who wanted to run websites. Not, not any more or less than that. And our goal was to do it without any customer service whatsoever. We wanted you to just sign up and run your server and that's it. And, you know, our, uh, that, in fact, the, the, the three Trinity kids promised us that there would be almost no employees in this business. And so, you know, today Rackspace has 6,000 employees. And so I feel a little bit misled. Um, but, you know, what happened was uh, the business took off and, uh, you know, um, there's nothing like being at the right place at the right time. We launched um, uh, December 27th of 1998. And when we showed up for work um, uh, in January, um, we, the business uh, really took off from the very beginning. And we found out that half of our customers were actually not in the US. So there were, there were people, entrepreneurs around the world who needed a server to make their email work or to make their internet, to make their website work. Uh, they needed a server um, and we would provided it to them for $500 a month. So, and also we, we didn't require, uh, we, we just, we didn't invoice them. We just basically hit their credit card for 500 bucks and they got the server for the next month. And it was a very simple business of just trying to rent people's servers. And this seemed like a lot like real estate to me, right? Just instead of renting office space, we're renting a server. If the customer didn't pay their bill, we just we resell the server to somebody else. And so that, you know, I, it's just that there's, there's nothing like being at the right place at the right time. The internet in 1999 was, was growing like crazy. What we were doing, uh, we weren't the only people doing what we were doing. There were about a hundred other companies that had similar amount of capital raised as we did. But when we first went into business, we thought we were really only one of about three or four, but it turned out we were one of about a hundred. Um, but, you know, the whole industry was growing so fast and, um, and let me just say that we did a terrible job in that first year. Uh, we had so many angry customers. Um, you know, we had, uh, if anybody in the audience was one of our customers back in 1999, you know, you, uh, uh, you know, you, we would spend a lot of time in our voicemail jail system. You know, uh, you'd say, you know, we are, uh, the, 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 one of my co-founders, uh, was, a uh, uh, was, a uh, the CEO at the time. And, and if you sent him an email, you'd get an autoresponder that said, you know, uh, I don't get, I don't really check my email. And then if you call them, you'd get a voicemail that said, you know, please, please contact someone else. So it's like, there was no way out. But uh, so I actually, you know, um, we really tried to figure out whether we really changed our strategy 180 degrees um, and went from there being a a, a no service model to being a high service model. So, you know, I used to think that I used to call it our, our, uh, our, our denial of service period was kind of the first years when we really tried to do as little as possible for our customers. Um, uh, because we were growing so fast, it was hard for us to do anything anyway. But then we really found that as the business commoditized and we had to fight, had to, uh, fight for price, we, um, we, we said, no, let's actually, and let's ask, let's offer good service. Let's be the first company to offer good service. And, and that really made all the difference. We invented a thing that we call fanatical support, 
which is a promise that we would we would do our darndest to help you fast and with great expertise and with the level of urgency that that you'd want. And I would just say that we became the most trusted uh, company in our industry at the time that there really were no leaders in the industry. Um, we it used to be called web hosting or or managed hosting or dedicated hosting, um, and uh, today we call it cloud computing or cloud hosting for, for the most part. Um, but back at that time, there were very few customers that were uh, very few companies that were really worth a darn. And, and uh, uh, because everybody was growing so fast, nobody really had to do a very good job. And uh, I would say that because my partner and I were the bus were business people, we, we just had a, we had, we came at the business from a, more of a business angle, while most of the people in the industry um, came at it from a techie angle. And so, uh, you know, if anybody out there has an IT person in their business, you'll know that the IT department is not renowned for giving great service to the rest of the business. And I think that that, you know, we, we really sort of brought, brought this, uh, this goal of great customer service, this idea we brought to, to the industry for the first time, and we became famous for it. And that's why, you know, today Rackspace is more than two and a half billion in revenue um, and it's on, back on the stock market again. So I would just say that, that we became one of the largest companies in the world doing what we do because we ultimately made a promise of, uh, that we were trustworthy and a promise that we would be responsive and have good service. So, you know, it was a, I was at the company 18 years. Um, at the end, uh, you know, I have, uh, uh, the, there were, there were, uh, Pat, Matt, Pat Condon, Richard Yu, and Dirk Elmendorf were the three Trinity kids. My partner, uh, my business partner we went into business with was Morris Miller. But then after, uh, then about 18 months after we started, we hired two, uh, two uh, gentlemen who became uh, critical collaborators to me, uh, and that's Lanham Napier and Lou Mormon. So really, uh, Lanham, Lou, and I uh, were with the business really all the way through, um, and uh, uh, I left in 2018 when we sold the company. Uh, we we were public at the time, but we sold it. Uh, we took it private. The company Apollo Global Management bought us, and uh, they actually recently went public again. So, uh, so you know, here we are, 21 years later, and um, and you know, it's public again. Uh, billion billion two billion two and a half billion of revenue and uh, overall value of the company of of eight billion dollars. So it's amazing. You know, even though we don't, I don't run it anymore, and I don't have any role there. You know, I'm very proud of it, and uh, I think it's been—it's also been, I think, a cornerstone of the, of the, uh, of the the tech industry here in San Antonio, and I'm really proud of that. You know, I'd like to think that we sort of took the place of what DataPoint started. We sort of took the baton 20 years later, and and uh, you know, I hope it's around and strong for many years. Well, you mentioned you mentioned a lot of other names uh, that that you've partnered with and and um, and brought into the industry and and really grown. Um, we we got to hear from Lorenzo Gomez and, and Randy Smith earlier in the year. Uh, you know, uh, Lorenzo with Geekdom and Randy with uh, Weston Urban. Uh, you you seem to have, you've found some good, great talent. You've, you've been able to put together these great teams and, and do all the things that you've done. What, what do you think, what's the biggest thing that you look for when, you, when you're you know, meeting, meeting potential business partners meet, uh, or employees? Uh, yeah. You know. Well, you know, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled that Randy, Randy and Lorenzo, I think they came in when I was sick, right? I, was, I had COVID and they came and pinched hit for me. We didn't know it was COVID at the time, but we knew you were really sick and we're, and uh, don't take this the wrong way, but we're glad you didn't come speak to us that day. <laughs> yes, yes. Don't <laughs> yeah, the worry. There was no risk. I was completely out of it. Um, but, uh, you know, Randy, I would say that, that both Randy and Lorenzo are, are really important people in my life. Um, I think the most important thing that I look for is just, is, is, is of course, you know, can they get the job done? But more important is, are they a fit with me? Because, um, they, I think that both of those guys are, uh, are very special because of the way that they, that we collaborate together. And, and I, I would say that, um, fit is the number one thing that I would say is important. Uh, that's what I personally, uh, is, is really, I think the difference between business being a pleasure and it being tense and, and, uh, 
you know, whenever you have a, whenever you have a, you know, uh, uh, when you have people working together that aren't, aren't, aren't able to get along, you know, you have tension all the time and it becomes so much harder and more stressful. So I'm really proud of the, of, of, of the, both of those guys. And we have a, a, a much bigger team than that, that of uh, people doing different things. But um, uh, so I would say fit is the number one thing for me. Um, and I think, um, you know, I think that um, probably the, you know, Rackspace, almost all of our employees at Rackspace were young. Um, it's because these were people who grew up with the internet. You know, if, if, if we'd hired, um, you know, um, older, older people, we did, we had older people, of course, but I'm just saying our, most of our population was very young. And I think that, that younger, younger people are much more, um, uh, let me say baby boomers are very different than the rest. Okay. Baby boomers are very prepared to, they expect to sacrifice for, they expect to be loyal and they expect to be, to sacrifice for the boss and for the, the company. And I would just say that that notion is, doesn't really, that notion doesn't work as well with younger people. Um, I was one day, it doesn't mean, I, I'm not saying that you can't gain loyalty from younger people, they're not that at all. But I'm saying you have to earn it from younger people. Whereas I think baby boomers tend to give it, they see it as a badge of honor to give their loyalty. And they just, and that, so I think that the question I think came, came to be, how do we ultimately earn our people's loyalty? How do we earn their, um, we used to say that, that our employees are all volunteers. They're volunteers. They have to volunteer to be with us and because they have altered alternatives. But also, they have to. We have to get them to volunteer to do their best work. Um, you know, we at the at the time that Rackspace was growing really quickly, uh, we really didn't have much in the way of of management systems, or uh, we really were were amateurs at every every end of the business. And so, we really counted on people doing their best. And I think that our whole management method was all around trying to get our people to do their best. For themselves, not for their, not because of a bonus, not because of a uh, their boss, or so. I think that we have this little saying, which uh, which I think is uh, is very powerful, um, which uh, I think has proven over the years to be very powerful, and that is it answers the question of what do we all want from work, and this is kind of the formula that um, that was my sort of personal philosophy, which is what do we want from work? We want to be valued members on a winning team on an inspiring mission. And if ultimately our work, um, if our work can help answer those questions, uh, then, you know, we will ultimately do our best and be happy there, right? And be well performing. So, you know, let's go through it. We want to be valued members, means we all want to feel valuable, right? That means that uh, other people are saying thank you. It means that our, being, we're respected, but we're also valued as a member. We're valued members. A member means you belong to something, right? We all want a sense that we belong to something. So we're valued as a member, but we're also part of a winning team. And a winning team, everybody knows what it feels like to be part of a losing team. Um, you know, it feels, it just kind of, you know, it's a bummer. And so to, to feel that we're, we belong and are valued as part of a winning team is the, to me the core formula. And then ultimately, especially for young people, we want to feel that they're part of an inspiring mission, that all the days of their life add up to something, all the days of their work life add up to something that's worth telling your grandchildren. So this is sort of the little four point formula that, that I think that I sort of stumbled across um, that uh, is probably one of my proudest observations in business is we all, what do we want from work? We want to be valued members of a winning team on an inspiring mission. And I would just say that that is the sort of the cornerstone of, of the, of, of my personal management philosophy. And, and we, uh, and I would just say that, that, it, it was a good fit within Rackspace because it had so many young employees. We all want those things, but I think younger employees, younger people are just much more centered around getting the company to earn their loyalty rather than expecting their loyalty. Those are, those are good points. Um, and and Lorenzo, I, I've read Cilantro Diaries. He mentioned, uh, he mentioned some of those points several times. Um, 
you've you've moved on and you've you've had a couple you've got a couple other things a couple other irons in the fire one of those lorenzo uh is a part of and talked about a lot is geekdom the work yes. share space um, yes how has the pandemic affected that how how are the members of, of geekdom doing right now well we're shut down um now we're not totally shut down today but we today you know we're probably uh uh you know probably a quarter the same number of people are there every day. You know, Geekdom is both a, a, a startup incubator. Um, it's a place, if you're gonna start, start up, we wanna be the place where you turn. Um, we have mentors, we have classes, uh, we have other, you know, there are other people who wanna start businesses there, but we're also a co-working space where people can go and, you know, if, you, if, a, if somebody doesn't have an office or if they wanna have a, uh, you know, they want to have a, either a desk or a full-blown office. They can rent rent that from us, and so um, uh, we are. Uh, you know, the occupancy is way down. There's the usage is way way down, uh, probably down eighty percent. Um, and uh, but it's rising all the time. And I think that you know, it's it's. Uh, I I think the the most important thing is that you know we we want to we want Geekton to get back. Uh, we want to help all those entrepreneurs that have been sitting at home. Let's, uh, let's help people launch their next business. I think that entrepreneurship and innovation are just critical things to our city. I think that they're ingredients that, that, uh, we, that we need much more of. And, and I, it doesn't have to be in the tech field. I mean, I know that I talk a lot about that, but I think that whether it's a restaurant or a civil engineer or an architect or whether it's a, a trash hauler, all of these, all of these things, if your heart is drawn to a certain opportunity in one of those areas, they're all good to me. So um, I think that all having passion for the business you want to start is the most critical thing. You know, you can't really start a business in an area that, that you don't have some passion for. So I think that, you know, Geekdom, as long as, you know, I really want Geekdom to get back into full gear in uh, helping people start their businesses again. Um, so, and, so, and that's really a, 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 a not-for-profit uh, area. The other thing is, is, uh, is, I think Randy Smith has already come to talk to you about, uh, is, is, is the idea of rebuilding downtown. How do we ultimately make downtown? Well, my overarching mission is how do we make San Antonio a place that my children would want to move home to? And, you know, go ask your kids. I bet if I could see, a uh, see people raise their hands, I would ask you, do you know, do you think your kids expect to move back to San Antonio? And an awful lot of young people would answer no because they don't find San Antonio has the the things that they're looking for. You know, a city needs to be a, a talent magnet. Needs to be a magnet for bringing people back to, back to us. You know, people go away to college, and you know, will they come back? You know, I just remember. You know, I don't know if y'all remember this, but you know, I didn't have many friends at at uh, in Aggie Land that were from San Antonio. Most were from Dallas and Houston. And the friends that I, the friends that I did have from San Antonio, most of them went to Dallas or Houston after school. And just think about the huge amount, number of people that we've lost, the brain power that our city has lost. We've gained some too. We've gained some too. But I'm saying we, we have not. We have lost a lot of people to those big cities. And just think about how, how our great San Antonians have gone to those places and built those cities and made them stronger. We just have to be very, very conscious of needing a value proposition uh, that makes San Antonio a great place to put your future. And of course, having good job opportunities is, is a very important one. Few people are gonna move here without, without, uh, without their jobs. But I think that there are people who move to other cities without jobs. And I'll just give, use Austin as an example. You know, there are people moving to Austin without jobs. Uh, you know, there are quite a few of them under the bridges over there, right? Right, but uh, but I mean, there are people who move to Austin without jobs. There are people who go there and stay, right? And I think you end up with a with Austin being a, a talent magnet that ultimately has has drawn you know companies like Apple and Oracle and Facebook. All those companies came to Austin because they thought that the that that the quality of life there would would make Austin an ongoing talent magnet. And so I think that ultimately that's what San Antonio needs to be better at. And I think we're way better than we were a decade ago. But I think we still have a long way to go. Well, uh, definitely. I, you know, when I think of San Antonio, I think of it as a big, small town. Uh, I'm from San Antonio, so I, you know, I have a, 
bias. I love I love San Antonio, but a lot of a lot of people view it as a um, touristy town. And and um, you know when you look at the skyline, it's not it's not uh, the same as Houston, Austin, Dallas. It's it's not as uh, sexy of a city, I guess. So what so what are your plans to to change that to to you know to to take San Antonio to the next level? There's plenty of people here, but like yeah. you said. Um, you know, it's well, you know, I, I'm really focusing on downtown um, and, you know, the COVID is going to change the world here. We don't know exactly how, but, you know, I, I think that, that the, um, we do not have enough urban alternatives. So many of us, once we have kids, we want to, we want to have a, you know, we want to have a bigger house and a bigger backyard. And that's, and that's great, by the way, that's great. Um, that's what I have. But I think that when half the population is not married, so you have a, those lowest number of, 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 of married people in the history of America, and people are getting married later. So the average uh, people getting married is in the, in the, 30, in the young 30s. So you have a much bigger population in their 20s that is looking, these folks, many of them are looking for urban alternatives, a place where they can live in a, you know, an apartment that, an, an apartment where they can uh, be really proud of it, where they can walk to a coffee shop. I mean, I would challenge you, how many different apartment buildings in all of San Antonio could you even walk to a coffee shop? You know, um, I mean, how many? Like, not other than whole, around Pearl, whole. I mean, maybe, I mean, it's probably not two. Right, so where where they can walk, go out front door and and uh, you know go for a run or take their dog. I mean, I think that there is an urban lifestyle that um, that I think a, a lot of young people are looking for that San Antonio doesn't provide or has been weak on. You can now see it coming to life in the in the uh, the Pearl area, and um, I'm doing some. Um, I'm I've bought up uh, nearly 20 acres of downtown over on the Northwest side near where the city hall is. Um, and there's a, going to be, so we're gonna be building apartments. We already built the Frost Bank Tower. I hope you'll like that. Um, I'm pretty proud of it. Um, thank you, Randy Smith, who was here earlier. Um, but also I think probably the biggest thing to happen to downtown um, uh, in the last uh, 20 years is, is UTSA is moving um, 15 to 20,000 of its students downtown. And UTSA today is 35,000 students. It's slated, the Board of Regents has, has uh, said it's gonna grow to 50,000. So it, imagine 50,000, I bet there aren't, I bet there aren't 20 people in the audience who were at, in, at A&M when it was 50,000. So that's gonna be a big school, right? And I think that, and, and I've been uh, a big part of creating a new computer science program called Data Science Program. And there's good, it's going to be one of the best and biggest in the country. And, um, and so that is going to give opportunity to our young people that they've never had before. Um, there are, just to give you a little snapshot, um, there are only a, about a dozen data science graduates out of UTSA each year right now. And nearly all of them have, uh, I mean, in fact, all of them have gotten very, very, very high paying jobs straight out of school. You know, uh, and there's a shortage of these jobs. Data science are the, these are the technologies that create self-driving cars and artificial intelligence and things like that. And the other thing is the business school is gonna be moved downtown. So I think the business school for, for UTSA and the, and, the, uh, and the data science school, I think are gonna be transformative. We're gonna find downtown is gonna be a completely different atmosphere, you know, in five years. So you are you focusing more on housing for downtown or for, for all these new students and, and, and uh, people that are starting up businesses and stuff? Yes, yes. We're, we're going to be building uh, many, many hundreds of apartment units downtown. And, um, you know, the COVID, uh, COVID, has, COVID has thrown a wrench in the works here a little bit, slowed us down. But I think, you know, in the long run, we, you know, it's, it doesn't mean San Antonio is going to be a, a, an urban city like a, like a Chicago or New York. It just means that we need urban options um, so when, 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 uh, when people want to live in an apartment long-term, they can. And when, they, when in, a, in a place, you know, if you go to Pearl right now, uh, you, you'll see the sort of uh, 
the, the amenities and the, the lifestyle that you can have there. And it's not for everybody, but there are, you know, there's a, a good fraction of young people who are very interested in, in that as an option. Yeah, if, in, maybe it's just me, but it seems like in San Antonio, it's either you're either up here or you're down here on um, um, yeah. places to live, um, as opposed to, a, you know, I, I travel all around for work and being in Houston, Dallas, Austin, there's a lot of in between uh, in those cities that we don't quite have in San Antonio. And, uh, yeah. like I, 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 th I think also the, um, the apartment business, I'm sure there are some real estate folks in the, in the, in the audience and you can heckle me if you want, but I won't even know it because I can't hear you. But, um, you know, I think that the apartment building, the suburban world, uh, the purpose of apartments in, the, in a suburban city like San Antonio is really a holding tank until you buy a house. It's a, it's sort of, a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a temporary place. It's where you live while you either save up money for a down payment for a house, you're going to get, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're, just, you're going to, um, you know, look for a house. It's not intended to be, uh, even the nicer apartments are not really uh, often intended to be long-term. Um, let's, let me say apartments intended to be long-term are a very small percentage of all of our apartments. But there is a, if you lived in New York or if you, uh, you may never own your, own your house, you may rent the entire time. Uh, also, an awful lot of young people are not just not as interested in owning. They see it as tying them down. They see it also as if you own, you end up losing all those amenities. Imagine if you live at the, I love the Pearl. They, I mean, the Pearl, folks at Pearl have done such a great job. You know, if you live at the Pearl, you walk to the coffee shop over here, you walk to the gym over there. That is, you, you, you can actually do an awful lot of your weekend without ever getting into your car. And also you all, you have friends and, and functions and, and clubs and things all within walking distance. And I think that, you know, it doesn't mean we all have to live that lifestyle, but you know, if you have been to the Pearl, you can appreciate the fact that we're all better off having it. The Pearl ends up being, you know, I think way more authentic than the Riverwalk has gotten, right? I mean, with, you know, an awful lot of the Riverwalk is, is now, um, you know, it's, it's Dick's last resort and it's, it's, uh, it's, um, uh, you know, what's that uh, uh, Rio, Rainforest Rio. Cafe. Rio, Rio, I'm, I'm thinking about the, you know, the chains that don't really oh. suit us, right? They're, they're just chains. You know, they're not really authentic San Antonio. And so, um, and I think that, but if you go to the Pearl, you can see that the, the Pearl is, you know, all those restaurants there are real San Antonio. And they, you know, it's where I, it's now where, um, you know, I love, I love the Pearl and the way that it's sort of added a whole new, experience to our city and so we need more of that well i got an email today uh sam's burger joint is starting up live music on uh october 3rd with two tons of steel not awesome uh, so just putting a plug out for that but but uh, yeah glad hope things are getting back to normal or getting closer back to it um you know you've talked a lot about um entrepreneurship and and uh you being an entrepreneur yourself, you've got, um, it seems like you've got a long line of entrepreneurs in your family. Are, are these traits that you have, are they hereditary, taught, preached? Did your dad bring you up saying this, son, this is what you need to do? Or is it just in your blood or? Yeah, well, I, I would say definitely my father did not, uh, my, my father definitely encouraged us to, uh, to be entrepreneurs and uh, yes, definitely. But I, I think that, you know, I just think that it's, uh, it's just like you see if one family has a lot of doctors in them. You know, I think that it, it's just an awful lot of, uh, you know, what career you go into, um, you know, how many different partnerships, you know, uh, how many civil engineers are there with who have civil engineer children in their businesses. You know, I think it's, it's familiarity, it's understanding, it's a, you know, uh, that's an awful lot of it. Um, but certainly, I would say my father, um, you know, my father wanted, wanted me to run the ranch, but he also certainly expected, uh, expected, uh, uh, you know, really, uh, expected us to be in business for ourselves. And, you know, I, I don't know that that is, is right for everybody, but it certainly was right for me. So I, I'm very thankful for the way that my father brought me into his business very, very, very young. And, uh, and so, you know, all the, all the normal risk that we take, you know, st starting our own businesses kind of uh, was par for the course for me, but, uh, but, uh, but I'm very proud to be part, part of a 
family of entrepreneurs very much. Um, both um, my whole family is. Well, um, what, what's a typical uh, work week look like in the life of Graham Weston right now? What kind of things are you working on right now? Uh, you know, that, that you can talk about. Well, um, so uh, today we're, we're filming this on the 16th of September. And so by the time this is, this video is, comes out, this, uh, my, my new project will already be public. Um, so um, I got COVID from my son, my Aggie son, and he had no symptoms. And so this whole idea that the COVID, the COVID was spreading through asymptomatic people, this always really bugged me. And uh, a couple of months ago, I decided, oh, also I was part of the governor's uh, strike force for COVID. And so I, it kind of gave me permission to get my head into the COVID problem a little bit more, um, especially as I was recovering, because it probably took me a month to get my energy back. Wow. But I, uh, we've, we've heard about many, many people are getting tested and it takes five, six, seven days to get their test results back. Um, I, with, uh, with my uh, co-founders, um, Bruce Bug and Tullus Wells, we've, we've uh, funded and created a, uh, a laboratory to do COVID testing. And I'm actually sitting in the lab right now. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the, the South Texas Blood Bank um, has been our partner and they're absolutely fantastic people along with the medical school. Medical school has provided a lot of the scientific um, uh, backup and expertise to get to get our laboratory validated and then the folks at the blood bank have been absolutely fantastic partners so what happened was they uh tell us wells bruce bug and i um you know uh, they they are rep they represent foundations we put the put in uh, money to start a uh to start a uh, uh, uh this covid testing lab um and the lab is going to have the capacity to do twelve thousand tests a day and with one day turnaround. And so um, I think that, you know, I don't think we're, I don't think that the, uh, this, think about this as a backup plan for the vaccine. You know, I'm, I'm very hopeful that the vaccine is going to, going to uh, make COVID irrelevant. Um, let's hope that happens. And uh, I, and, but I think that the backup plan is to have testing available so that we can do it cheaply. It's $35 a test. Um, and we can do it fast. We'll have turnaround in less than a day. Um, and, and we have basically unlimited capacity. So the capacity has been a real problem throughout COVID. That's the reason the tests have come back so slowly. So, but, um, so we'll see how it goes. And I think one of the, one of the risks is, you know, maybe we'll, maybe it'll be too late. We should have had it over the summer. Maybe it's too late, but our goal is, so, you know, history will see whether what we did has an impact, but I think that we're trying to, uh, I, I believe that that we need to be better prepared. Um, anybody there think that we weren't really well prepared for this pandemic? I mean, I certainly do. You don't you don't get to spend five trillion dollars on stimulus very many times in a lifetime. You know, five trillion dollars, and and so if we had had really high scale testing, we probably could have we could have suppressed the virus much faster than we have. And so um, I'm really happy that I've gotten support of the governor and from uh, the local, uh, again, from the medical school. And so, you know, we're, uh, we're very hopeful that we'll be able to do tens of thousands of tests here in San Antonio and make it safer, make the city safer, create COVID safety zones. Um, we're going to start off by doing it in the schools, but then, by the, then we're going to uh, we're gonna start doing businesses once we have the capacity to do it. The other thing is we hope to inspire, um, uh, we hope to inspire other cities to do the same thing. The name of our lab is Community Labs LLC, and um, you could Google that and learn more about it on our website. Um, uh, but uh, Community Labs is really intended to inspire other cities to build their own labs. Um, and uh, again, if any city could have an additional 10,000, 12,000 tests a day like we do, I think that they could, it could be a very important tool to prevent the next pandemic from catching hold. Um, I think about it, and my last point on there is that I think about it like um, uh, during World War II, uh, Truman knew that he was making the atomic bomb and he hoped the atomic bomb would, would end the war. 
but he simultaneously planned for an invasion. Think about how costly that is. He was buying trucks. He was buying, you know, hiring, you know, enlisting soldiers. He was taking islands and doing battles like Midway and Iwo Jima that were hugely costly in human life. And he did all those things not knowing whether the atomic bomb was going to work. Well, to me, the, to me, he had two plans, right? And so even though he didn't, we didn't invade Japan, you know, we're all glad we didn't invade Japan. So in, in, in a way, I see this as um, in, in very similarly in that we all hope the, the atomic bomb is, is, vac is the vaccine. We hope that the vaccine will come along and will make this, uh, let us go back to our lives. But I think that until we have a vaccine that controls COVID completely, that I think the testing will be a useful tool. I think you, you brought up a great point on, on uh, were we prepared for a pandemic? And, um, and one of the, I guess one of the positives that you could pull out of this COVID is um, it kind of highlighted the weaknesses that, that uh, the country had and that our, every community has. And um, so that's, that's pretty cool that you're, you're, um, you're working towards, uh, get, you know, community labs to get, you know, that many tests and, and try to spread that out over the cities. So is that yeah. something that um, you plan on that being the, the future as opposed to if let's say that the vaccine comes out next week and we get rid of the pandemic, um, is that something that goes away or is this, is this something that's gonna be here to stay? Well, well, we'll turn off the lights and let it wait for the next one. Uh, you know, I sort of think that all the things that will happen could be good. So if it turns out it's, it's, that it's really uh, not needed, uh, that'll be because the, the virus is, has been suppressed and you know I'll be very happy about that right um, but I think that I think that what we really need is better we need pandemic infrastructure I mean someday we're going to have an undersecretary of pandemic response you know in the in the in the federal government uh, because we just weren't prepared I mean I you know uh, there's a lot of finger pointing but you know the preparedness of the our preparedness did not happen um, under Trump you know it didn't happen under Obama um, I'm saying that this is something that you would think that they had a pandemic plan from, you know, 25, 30 years ago, right? We, we, this threat has been with us forever. And despite the fact that you really don't have much of a plan, I mean, let me, I, let me just go through what we have to suppress the virus. We have wash your hands, wear a mask, distance, right? Anything else? Oh, lockdowns, <laughs> right? That's the nuclear option. I mean, it's devastating. Right, so that's it, that's kind of it. So what we're doing is what's referred to as assurance testing. That's the process of going into a, into a micro population like a business or a school and testing people who think they're well. What we're trying to do is find, we're trying to find people who, who actually are silent spreaders. We're looking for people who are not well, but they don't know it. They're, they're, they're infected with COVID, but they don't know it. If we can get them out of the population, we do two things. We let we stop them from spreading it further, but then we also give an assurance or sense of confidence to the people who remain because they've tested negative. So I would just say, wash your hands. This is not a very very long list of, of that science has produced. Right in the history of mankind, we've come up with with four basic ideas: wash your hands, masks, distance, lockdowns. We're going to add a fifth one, which is assurance testing, meaning we're going to test people who who don't think they're sick in order to try to identify silent spreaders. So, you know, I, I sure hope that, that we have a flurry of innovation in to prevent the next, uh, the next pandemic, you know, once we get past this one, knock on wood. Um, but I really think that we were ridiculously underprepared. Um, and, uh, and I would, I would really think uh, the idea of blaming the, just the politicians in, in, in the charge right now, I think is way too simplistic. It just, you know, really the, the institutions responsible for preparing us just weren't prepared. I mean, nobody, uh, you know, whether that's uh, the epidemiology departments at our universities uh, don't appear to have, uh, have contributed adequately. And then uh, the, and I think that the, you know, the, the CDC and the WHO have seemed to be have greatly underperformed. And, um, and I just think that we just weren't unprepared. So we have to be better prepared. If you think about the, the how, you know, this, this pandemic has been way more impactful than any hurricane. So, um, yeah. Well, there's, there's, there's definitely been plenty of books and, and even movies on uh, potential pandemics and how it affects the world. And I, I think 
it might just boil down to people don't want to deal with it until it actually happens or don't want to believe it until it, it actually happens. So this is uh, definitely good. Good for yes. us to know how, you know, God forbid we get something that spreads like this, but has a, the kill rate of like Ebola or something, you know. It's right, a, right. You know, it's it's a good thing for us. To, you know, it's kind of like a good dry run. Um, also, you know, let me just point, let me add one other, other thing, which is if you had to pick, if you had to have um, a virus, a, 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 a deadly virus, um, if it actually killed young people, it would be way more problematic. I mean, you, so the fact that it's really spared young people, I mean, in Texas, only 3% of the people who died have been under 45, 3%. I mean, it, it really means that it spares young people. And I think that if you're going to have a, if you're going to have a, a virus, um, you know, if you, if you actually, if it was killing young people as fast as, as older people, you know, it would be way more devastating uh, to just be more devastating. So I think that ultimately, we're all going to have to learn to live with some amount of risk. And I think that young people, because their risk is even lower, in fact, for most young people, you're probably, you know, a, this is not a scientific answer, but you're probably just as likely to, to die of a car wreck or some other, some other, you know, accident than you are of COVID. So it's, it's not that it, it's still dangerous, but I think that for young people, um, you know, it's going to be, it's, you know, really we sh I would love to be able to, uh, to let the young people go back and get the economy rolling again. Um, and the older people just need to be more cautious. So that's another, I think that over time, that's going to be one of the things that gets us past it. Hopefully, hopefully so. Yeah. If it was like the 1918 flu that, that, uh, really affected younger people, uh, and healthy people. Yes. Um, so, so Graham, you, you know, we'll, we we'll kind of, we're getting close to the end here uh, in trying to get prepared for this, um, when I try to look up Graham Weston, there's not much past 2013, uh, you know, in videos or anything. You've had really? a very low profile. Let, you know, you stay out of the spotlight for the most part. Um, how, how, do you, how are you able to do that? You say 2013? 2013. Now, when I look up videos, YouTube videos, I mean, I, everything stops at 2013. So you've kind of been huh. out of the limelight and, uh, you know, um, I think a lot of a lot of our younger members, a lot of people want to know, are, are yeah, you know, are you just out traveling the world, just you know, yeah, we have these you know, illusions, I, illusions of uh, you know, billionaires getting together in in Monaco yeah, and uh, dropping ten million on a blackjack game or something. What I, I, have, I haven't been, in, I haven't been invited to any of those games, <laughs> uh, any of those poker games. You know, um, you know, I uh, you can. Uh, you can ask my wife about whether uh, whether we we've not spent any time, uh, not nearly enough time, uh, doing those things. You know, I'm I'm still I'm, I'm 56, so I'm still have plenty of plenty of interests. Um, you know, I I uh, I think that I have just refocused on um, I've refocused on 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 helping on 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 my real estate and the startup uh, that is on Geekdom and on the real estate redevelopment of downtown. And those have been my primary focuses. And I just think that, you know, there, uh, prior to 2013, Rackspace was trying to make a name for itself. And of course, you know, I, I, everything we're doing was much more visible. So I just think that I've been plenty busy, but uh, I guess I just haven't been, it's funny I haven't been in the paper. That's, I'm, uh, that's, that's interesting. Um, but, you know, I, I would just say that I, 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 uh, I work with, um, uh, Mona Gowie, Mona, Mona Mitchell, who's the head of my, uh, of, of my real estate company and then development company is Randy Smith. Lorenzo Gomez is over the, my foundation and, uh, and uh, over Geekdom. And so, I mean, I'm working with them constantly and I'm also looking at new ideas. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think this COVID, uh, the COVID testing lab came around at, at a good time where, I, where it was of interest to me and it was something where I had the the, the, the time uh, to, to focus on it. And so I would just say that my core, how I operate is much more as a, I'm a catalyst, right? If there are things that, that I help catalyze things or move them in, into action. Um, and I would say that I'm not as, I'm not as good at, at sort of the, the daily operational, uh, uh, you know, daily operational uh, businesses. And, and those, so that's why 
really my, my enterprises run pretty autonomously. That is, I'm not running them myself, most of them. I'm basically, um, I, that is, I'm, I'm very involved, but, but I think that, that uh, you know, those are things that are, are, are working, uh, you know, day in and day out. And I am, I'm really try looking for things to catalyze. And, um, you know, that's why I feel this COVID lab is such a good fit for me. But, you know, it's funny. Um, uh, so I, I left Rackspace in 2018. So that, you know, things were, things were pretty uh, moving fast until I left in 2018. And then you know, there's a new regime. So I, I, it's natural that I'm not there, that, you know, uh, not in the press after that. But, uh, you know, um, I just think that I'm more of a behind the scenes person anyway. I mean, I, I really like to uh, be supporting or catalyzing the activities that other people are, are doing. So I would say that that's probably the biggest reason. Uh, but, uh, you know, I haven't traveled the world too much yet. I uh, look forward to doing that, though. Well, uh, Graham, thank you very much for uh, joining us and, and, and being part of our virtual lunch. Hopefully we can get back to in person soon. Um, but we, we sure do appreciate you uh, taking the time out, especially uh, right now down at the lab, uh, getting all that uh, yes. going. By the time this airs, that's going to be a big deal. That that will be in the paper. You'll be in the, you'll be in the newspaper for that, for sure. Uh, also, I'm going to do my best to attend your um, the skeet shoot. That sounds fun. I'd love to meet meet your members there. Hey, th hey, that is great. That is that's yeah. really awesome. Look forward to, to seeing you there and uh, look forward to seeing you around. Thank you, Graham. Great. Good to be with Bye. you. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, sir.